Hi, and welcome to another live Q&A. Today I've got Roger Masterson with me, uh, the castle man he's known as, uh, the founder of Celtic Castles. How are you? I'm well, Johnny. Thank you very much for having me on your show. It's a pleasure. Um, just to remind everyone, we're live streaming on Facebook, LinkedIn, and YouTube. We are also, uh, you might be listening to us, we're on a podcast, uh, and it's great for you to be here. Thank you for joining us. Um, so, Roger, um, you, you really are known as the castle man, aren't you? I mean, you've, you've fully gone with this branding. In, in fact, I said you're the, the founder of Celtic Castles, but on your LinkedIn profile, you've, you, you say that your job title is T-Boy. Uh, well... I'm, I'm not into hierarchy, which is really the message behind that. And uh, to be fair, I don't make a lot of tea in the office, but I do make tea. Uh, and uh, we all share that about. But no, I, I prefer flat structures and everybody to get involved in as much as possible. I, I had a feeling that there was something behind the name. Um, and having <laughs> spoken to you before, I, um, I, I yeah, I, I, I thought that, that there was something around that and, and this this whole team uh, ethos, et cetera. Um, you, you're an entrepreneur. You very kindly help other businesses as well. Um, it's sort of a hobby, I think, and a way to give back from what I can understand. Um, what I wanted to do was just understand, you know, th this entrepreneurial spirit, how you got, how how this all started. Um, and and from what I can understand, you started at the age of 10, this 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 crept into you. Yes. Um, I mean, I, I lived in a little village in Belfast um, and uh, there was a local petrol station. So we, we, we wanted to earn money. Um, so we tried to get jobs and I was lucky enough to get a couple of jobs as a, as a, a, a young boy growing up there. Uh, and one of them was serving petrol in the, the olden days. And um, I would be serving petrol uh, as cars came through and I'd clean the windscreen, I'd change their oil. And I very quickly realized that if I provided more service, um, I could potentially get a tip, earn more money, et cetera, and um, people would keep coming back. So that was sort of the roots of, oh, gosh, you know, this is, is this how business worked? I also did some crazy stuff that uh, we worked for a local farmer called Dickie Simpson, and we'd get a pound a day for bringing the hay in uh, at the end of the summer holidays. And, and it wasn't great money. Well, I suppose it was all right money then. But it was a long day's work, heavy work. And then um, his his sister would come out with lunch. So we'd sit for an hour and, and have this beautiful homemade food amongst the bales. So that was another thing I did. That was brilliant. Uh, just to remind people that are watching, uh, you uh, you can ask questions with pleasure. So this is live. You can ask questions if you've got questions for Roger. Um, or if you're listening, you can leave comments. And uh, I can always come back to you and add further notes in the show notes. Um, so... You started out uh, in the petrol station. It gave you that entrepreneurial. Yes. I mean, I mean, yeah, I, I hear what you're saying. It taught you about is is this how business works? You give yeah. more, you get more money back. I mean, that's that's an interesting concept, isn't it? Um, but you then fell into retail. So how did how did the MS job come out? Well, <clears throat> um, in my sort of teenage years, I also set a couple of other businesses up, a window cleaning round and whatnot, and 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 then eventually sold that. But um, I wanted to get away from Belfast um, uh, and I was looking for a, for a job to do that. And so you had two routes. One, one was going into the forces and you would do well there, but that was staying at home. And I wanted to get off the island. Not that I dislike Ireland at all. I love it. And any opportunity I have to get home, I want, I want to get home. But um, I was lucky enough to get on the uh, Marks and Spencer Young Management Training Scheme and went through that. And that sort of uh, was stimulated from a guy at school who'd done it a few years beforehand and just went on a store trip and thought, oh, this is great. And this retail idea uh, started to come through. My parents um, had bought a retail uh, confectionery and tobacconist shop. So I was interested in it from then and worked with them. And um, I wanted just to take it and, and learn a lot more. So that took me uh, to Swansea, where I started in my first M&S store and, and went down the commercial route of, uh, you know, selling on the shop floor and then opening new stores and, and working abroad with them. So uh, I learned a lot in M&S um, about, you know, how to market and place product, although a lot of it was being part of a system, which I think you'll be aware of with your retail background as well. Yeah. Well, I mean, 
you could go to university and, and do some sort of business studies. You could do A levels in business studies, but I I think you'd agree um, that getting training on the job training in an organisation, I'm not sure you can beat that. Is that is that fair to say? I, I, w- I would say so. In fact, the reason I didn't go to university is I didn't have the confidence to do that. Um, and um, I wasn't academically gifted. I mean, if you'd read some of my school reports, you'd be hor- horrified at what people would say. Um, and um, learning on the job for me was, was, was what made a difference. But also it was working in teams. And you learned a lot about how not to do stuff as well. Um, although you had this system, you could challenge it. But we worked very, very long hours in retail, and uh, we had to put up with a lot. But that gave me a very, very solid grounding on, you know, tips and techniques and the questions to ask and, and how to understand how sales changed and what you could do to affect those. It, it's funny how you say about academia. Uh, I, I always remember uh, doing my A-levels, my my A-level uh tutor turned around to my yeah. parents and said and said if, if johnny focused uh, as much as he did on buying and selling in the, in the sixth form common room as he does on his maths then he'd actually do quite well um but <laughs> but there we go we we had a few scams going on at school as well where we were retailing <laughs> stuff in the background which we probably shouldn't have been doing to be fair <laughs> <laughs> these life lessons exactly. um, so so we are going to talk about um the whole uh hospitality industry we're going to talk about castles you know i, I um I, I think uh i wanted to talk about your favorite castles but seeing that that all of them, them are your clients I'm, I'm i'm guessing that's a difficult one for you to answer <laughs> I'd, I'd, I'd like to get on to, to castles um but for now um very much want to focus on the entrepreneurial side and the and the business side and the wider picture um and and so to keep us going so so you you did the management training in in m s you learned a lot uh you helped open some stores i think were you involved, were involved yes in that? yes part of the store development in europe and whatnot what was quite interesting in m s and, and i probably didn't fit very well into this sort of structure that they had um was you know you'd be instructed from head office to do something. And I'd look at that and think, that doesn't make sense to me. And I'd do something different and double the sales on something else and then get my knuckles wrapped and told to put it back to the way head office had wanted it. Um, So I was always trying to beat the system and just try and do different stuff and be creative. And and, and I kept coming up against resistance to that. So um, after about six years, uh, I left M&S and went into publishing. And that creativity then started to to come out from me. Um, And what I I realized, and at the age of 27, um, I couldn't understand why, you know, I I did what I did, but I found out I was dyslexic. And part of dyslexia, and and lots of people look at it as a very negative thing. Actually, it's, it's a fantastic skill to have because it's, it takes you down the creative route as opposed to the academic group. So that's why I was obviously not doing well at school. But um, within the publishing world, this creativity started to come out and my confidence really started to build. And I try lots of new product development in that area uh, and challenge the sort of status quo of, oh, we always do it like this. Are are you saying that um, creativity should be part of the strategy, being creative? Without a doubt. If you're not creative, uh, in, in this day and age in business, you're dead. If you continue to do what you've always done, uh, your business is just going to shrink. Um, you've got to change with markets, customer behavior changes even quicker now because of you know the online environment we're all here, we're, we're all in. And if you look at what's just happened in the last sort of eight months with the pandemic, we've never seen so much change in such a short period of time. Yeah, I, I was doing a podcast only, uh, I think, two episodes ago, uh, with uh, talking about uh, creativity and how and how it's totally part of the strategy. Um, I'm yeah. I'm wondering how uh, you, Roger, how you you, what are your tips for for staying creative and being creative? But before I, I, I go into that, I just want to quickly say, Carl Williams has commented, um, dyslexia is his superpower. He says, uh, so. Really? Uh, 
Yeah, well done, Carl. And it's sort of what Roger's saying as well, really. Um, I, I, little did I, I, I know. Remember, Johnny, we had we had a work experience uh, girl in the office, and one of the things that we want them to do when they're with us is is, is write a blog post. And she sat at this computer and everything else, and she read the brief, and then she she turned around and she said, "Oh, I can't do this." And I said, "Why?" I said, "Because I'm dyslexic." And the whole office went quiet because they know what my response was going to be like. And I said, oh, right. So do you find that you, you, you have trouble with spelling and you miss words and it doesn't make sense and everything else? I said, but do you find you're creative? Yeah, I says, well, I'm dyslexic too. So I want you to write a really creative piece about this. And I don't care whether there's any spelling mistakes in it or words missing. We'll understand it. Well, in fact, one of the things that you say is that you don't need perfection in business. You do, or, or sorry, uh, unfair. You don't always need perfection. No, eighty percent is fine. Um, uh, we have a few perfectionists in our team, and they are the first to admit: don't let the perfect get in the way of the good. Um, and I think people try and just get it, you know, perfect before they release something, or you know, be happy to put that out. Get it out there. Get feedback. And then change it and continually change it as you go through. And uh, I think that makes a big difference to, you know, making things happen. Look at the amount of stuff that we buy that's not perfect. Uh, and then we'll buy the next model as it goes through. Look at Apple. <laughs> that's a classic example of that. Microsoft, another good example of not having a perfect product when they release it. Yeah, no, totally. And and I think uh, the, the problem is we end up procrast procrastinating if we don't yeah. get on with it uh, and, and actually try things. Uh, Carl was just yeah. saying dyslexia means uh, he has to think about what he's doing and understand it. And ADHD means that he's got to understand something to accept it as well. So, uh, right. so those are some of the, the challenges that that, uh, that are out there. But I guess it makes you think differently, which is which is always good. Totally. So how what are your tips for uh, being creative then? How do you, because I think it's difficult to say, you know, right, you should just go and be creative. Um, so how do you naturally bring these things into your business? Well, I, I think it's going on in my head all the time because I'm challenging things and asking questions. But I heard some a, a, a lovely uh, little antidote uh, a few weeks ago, <clears throat> and it's <clears throat> get up at a different time every morning. So we all fall into habits. Don't get habits. Just different time every morning. Have a different breakfast every day. Little things like that. Get your neurons to work in a slightly different way. Um, walk to work. I'm lucky enough our office is, is close by, so it's a 15 minute walk. I don't walk the same route every day. I'll walk a different route. You see something different and that just stimulates another thought. So creativity is also about giving yourself time. Um, one of the things that I do and I really enjoy is meeting other business owners, not so much now during lockdown, but then saying, listen, can I come and have a morning with you in your business? Come and show me what you do. And I'll go around and I'll hear and, and watch what they're doing and see, can I take something from them or can I share something that we do? And that just gets the brain working in a different pattern, I would say. But if you feel you're falling into a habitual sort of process, cut that off straight away and do something different and creativity will follow. Yeah, I like, I like the idea of getting out of routines uh, because mm. I think routines can can stop creativity. Uh, yeah. and, and so I think that's a, a very good bit of advice there. You moved from retail into uh, publishing. Um, and, um, uh, and, and I think one of the biggest gaps you noticed, you know, you, you're naturally disruptive. One of the biggest gaps you noticed there was, hang on a minute, guys, everything's going online. Is it, what was the story there? What, 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 what happened? Well, it was my MD at the time and he had, uh, a, 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 one of the first published books about the internet. And, um, I just said, Oh, can I borrow this? Went home and read it. I thought this internet thing, this is, this is interesting. And I was sort of getting into technology. I taught myself how to use spreadsheets and type and whatnot uh, when, when the secretaries were away um, and I could grab one of their machines. But um, I just got all the editors uh, together and said, listen, we need to start thinking differently. And their response was, oh, gosh, no, it's not going to change. People are still buying newspapers. And of course, they did for a while. But, you know, we've seen the demise of, of the printed product uh, with, with, with you, the web and newspapers I, I, struggling left, right, and, center. I'm sorry to interrupt you. I mean, you were saying this really early on. You were, This was sort of mid-90s, You, yes, uh, from yeah. my understanding. I mean, you, you, were, you were well on the ball. Um, yeah, yeah. And so I can understand I, the resistance, I guess. 
Well, yeah, and, and again, there's an element of fear of change. People don't like it and whatnot. And if they don't see this further down the line and, and, and take on the opportunity, um, they're not going to want to invest time in it and whatnot. And I was probably getting a wee bit geeky. I was working away from home through the week. So what I would do is I'd get online and just start to understand how this works. Hang on, I can connect here and see something in New York and everything else. And I was more intrigued by... Oh, hang on, can we get a response from this? And, uh, you know, I, I do th to two, three in the morning and then get up the next morning, start work at seven, still in, in, the, in the real world of publishing, but thinking, hang on, internet, internet, this means something and it's, it's going to change a lot. So I was just intrigued by the whole, the, new, the, the newness of it and the opportunity. Was it and and were you uh, able to be instrumental whilst you were there, or did you, or, or were you just frustrated and then thought, you know, I'm going to do my own stuff digitally? Well, I, I got frustrated, but what I did, like a lot of people will do, is we built a business through the night, in effect, and did kept the day job so that I could build up reserves and then got enough money in the bank uh, that allowed me then to step out and start marketing this new idea that we had, and we were building a, a web presence for Scotland. Uh, that was that was our, our ethos and we wanted to look at building websites within the retail and tourism sector so that was the start of um, you know my my forages online and that led to us developing a, a web business which was probably ahead of its curve because we ended up not just building websites but from there explaining how to how your router works and how to connect to the internet and whatnot which took up a lot of time so we were probably a couple of years too early to be fair. Well, especially when you're using a dial-up modem on a 56k oh, or whatever it was. <laughs> the BT bills were horrendous. <laughs> well, you couldn't you couldn't use the phone at the same time, could you? I know. I know. <laughs> How things have changed. Absolutely. Um, so, so uh, interestingly, you set up. Um, you've had a, a, a number of online businesses um, mm -hmm. where um, you've managed to generate a huge amount of traffic, uh, and we'll yes. get onto uh, the the Celtic castles. Um, uh, but um, uh, you know, my background is search engine optimization. We were talking earlier, um, and and interestingly, I, I loved I loved what you said, which is actually you know, hold on. It's, it's about just offering really good service, really having a great product. People will come to you and, and that will naturally. And, and I love that way of thinking because, you know, if, if you get under the skin of Google, actually, that's, that's what they want. They want, they want just really good service and products. And so, so is that what you were trying to achieve in, in the businesses that you've set up online? It was all about the yeah. service. I think one of my key things is customer service. <clears throat> so, you know, if a customer's coming to find you, first of all, they've got to be able to find you. Uh, and I'm not into, you know, uh, the pay-per-click side of things and whatnot. I'm, I'm about organic search. So be at the top of the list, but be there because you deserve it. Um, and yes, you've got to understand SEO and, 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 and all the, you know, the gubbins that go with it. Uh, but when they come onto the website, it's about servicing. And, and my whole focus uh, in, in, in everything that I've done from a business perspective is if they can find you uh, and you can be referred and you're providing a, a good level of service and they want to come back and, and share that, then it will be a success. It might not you know, just happen overnight. It might take time to build that up, but it's word of mouth, it's word of email um it's customer feedback it's all those basic things that people then refer to others and if i go sort of to the celtic castles ethos um if somebody says oh i quite fancy staying in a castle i just want two responses oh have you seen the celtic castles website or oh, you must speak to roger <clears throat> the castle man uh, and if we get that we know we're doing something different. So referral for me is really, really important, but you've got to get the basics right so that those referrals start to come through. I mean, let's go to, to Celtic Castles. You've set up a, an award-winning uh, castle booking company. Um, what, what, was your, what was your fascination in castles? Uh, it came from bad service, Johnny. Um, I'd uh, seen an ad, a classified ad in the newspaper, in the Times, and um, sent off for this lovely booklet that came through, lovely A5. It was full of, uh, it was called Crofts and Castles, <clears throat> a little business that was, that was marketing these properties, but there were no Crofts in it. It was just bungalows and uh, a couple of castles that really I wouldn't want to go and stay in. And I like staying in unusual places. So I spent 18 months 
looking through all the Scottish Tourist Board brochures, and there was 19 regions at that time. And uh, my garage was full of brochures, and we found four castles that were advertising. So we sent off for the brochures. We put them a couple of pictures online, a bit of history and a, and a booking form. And from there, uh, because we had a couple of high traffic sites, uh, within three hours, a guy in New York filled a form in. I thought, oh, what do we do? Let's phone up the castle and see if there's a room available. Yes, 100 quid. We emailed this information back to this guy in New York, and he pinged his credit card over on the next email. I thought, blimey. Now what do we do? So we stuck it on a fax. We phoned up. And we said, oh, can we make this? <laughs> blah, blah, blah. And uh, we asked them to take the money. And they said, that's fine. And from there, uh, as I was putting the phone down, I just said, oh, normal agent's commission. And he said, fine. And I, and I put the phone down. And I just wondered, where did that come from? Uh, and that's literally how Celtic Castle started. And these four castles had more business in four months from what they thought was an advert. And we thought, hang on, we've got something here. Um, and our premise at the start was fastest back and service, as much knowledge as possible, even if we had to scrap around and find it when the inquiry came through, and we're selling at the same price. And then very quickly, they just kept telling their friends. And this was when the Americans were using email the way we use texts. So this was just getting shared. And that was the start of, and we called the business uh, then Stay in a Castle in Scotland, which is a rather long URL. <laughs> When did it get rebranded then? Well, I'm from Belfast, so that's the Celtic bit. Castles, we, we got together and we were under the stairs beside the washing machine and the fridge freezer. Uh, and, a, and a friend of mine uh, devised a, a little logo and we said, yeah, that looks good. And we've kept the name ever since. So, so what area does uh, Celtic Castles cover then, the, that website? <laughs> Well, we started off thinking there were just castles in Scotland, um, and then we realised, actually, there's a few in different parts of the UK. So we focused in, originally on the UK only, um, and we just built it up. We started in Scotland, got about 40 castles in Scotland, then moved into Ireland, found a few in England, etc. But our strategy is, is quite interesting because we don't go to the castles and say you should be on Celtic castles. Because we're in the internet, we wanted them to be in that arena as well. So they had to find us first and then connect with us. Now, what they didn't know is we'd probably been to stay already. We knew this property, been watching what it was doing. We measure the feedback they get. So we know whether we want them or we don't want them, but we don't knock on their door to say, be part of us. Because again, strategically, if they want to be part of us, we can work better with them. And the business is about knowledge and relationships. We use technology to drive and, and let people see this stuff but it's about what we know behind the scenes that helps convert the sale for the properties. Yeah, so I mean, that's a, a great place to be if you can uh, get drive that demand. Uh, Alex Goldstein just commented, uh, exactly that, Roger, client service and word of mouth is key. Uh, I mean, customer-centric marketing, you know, I think is really important yeah. being, having the customer at, at, at the focus. So, so you talked about uh, feedback, how, you, you, how important is customer feedback? Well, it's interesting because, you know, I, I look at failure as feedback. You know, we were talking about 80% earlier on. So failure is a great way to improve stuff. Uh, and we have failure as a, as a negative connotation in the UK in business and, and in life in general. Education, it starts with and then takes us through the rest of our lives. But feedback is, is, is just, it's one of the nectars of business. Um, when we look at our process, I want feedback about our service. So once we've, uh, you know, put a booking in place for a client, I want to know what they thought about Celtic Castles. Then you want feedback about the experiences that they've had when they're um, coming away from the castle. And <clears throat> those two elements then come together. Uh, it's quite interesting. There's a lot of press at the moment about false feedback and, you know, the reviews that aren't real, et cetera, et cetera. Um, we, we we see everything as it comes through and we monitor that and we use that then to improve everything that we do. So feedback's important from customers. It's also important internally as well. So again, thinking about teams, um, I want the team to give me feedback and my other fellow directors, and I want to be able to give them feedback. So again, when I was talking about no hierarchies, it's about us all working together um and so feedback is a, is a really big part of, of what we're all about going back a few steps you talked about failure just then um we've uh, we've both had to liquidate businesses um just talk to me about uh the 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 
some of the what you've learned what the learning that you had um from the businesses and, and the circumstances why you had to uh you know you, i think you were surprised in one of the businesses as, as what was going on behind the scenes yes yes <clears throat> I, I think um you know when, when i get involved with uh, smes and i go around and i'm talking to other business owners I, i'm shocked sometimes about how they don't measure the key stuff i mean classic things of oh I just realized how much VAT I've got to pay or everything else. Well, you should know that. Um, you know, you should have monthly accounts and, and, and just get those basics in place so there's no surprises. But um, the, the the element of um, – sorry, I've lost my train of thought, Johnny. No, what was the question? No, no, it's fine because, no, it's fine because you just introduced but something the, else that I wanted to ask anyway. Oh, I was going to say uh, liquidating, so, I was gonna, so, so, liquidating the business. Yeah. yeah, but uh, but but you talked about the accountant there, and I just want to step into that for a second because because from what I understand, you know, very very cleverly, I don't think there's such a word, uh, but um, <laughs> you you decided to to not just have your annual or sort of your quarterly meeting with your accountant in a, in a in a room for an hour, you went for a walk with them every quarter yes. for a day uh, to yeah. really understand how accountants what accountants thought of businesses and 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 how they worked with businesses. So yes. so you, very intuitive. For from, a, from quite an early age, I think, uh, on on really understanding how business works, is, is, is that right? That that's what you did. Well, that, that that's I suppose part of the creative thinking. It's thinking outside the box, um, and and one of this this was stimulated through the sort of the liquidation of this business. But I just thought, hang on, I, I can't afford to pay three, four, five hundred pounds a day for this advice. So why don't I pack a lunch up and I say, right, let's meet such and such, and we we go out for for a day and just walk and just chew the fat. Um, but what I could do is learn loads about accountancy and, and, and yeah. what I should be looking for in a balance sheet or whatever it might be and, and what I could learn from running the business. And, you know, we, we tend to see our accountants once a year to get the paperwork signed and that's it. But they are a font of knowledge, as are lots of other business people. So I do lots of walks, uh, arrange time getting people out of their businesses because, again, so many people are in the business and not on it so they're they're operational all the time uh and they can't take this time and i was just thinking well why can't you just take a day out to come for a walk uh, and i find that fascinating because i could do that but the liquidation side of a business and you know exactly what this is like it is the most horrendous place to be in when it happens and um, that whole aspect of, you know, waking up and worrying and five o'clock in the morning. There was two books that I picked up um, when I was going through that. And it took about two years to sort this particular problem out. Um, and it was uh, Anthony um, Robbins, Awaken the Giant Within and Unlimited Power. So those are the two books that I dived into and just learned so much from that. I wasn't interested in going on as expensive course. I got it all from just reading those books and that just started to give me ideas and options but you know when you liquidate a company you learn a lot about how to run a business and how not to run a business uh, and that failure element is where the learning comes from so if i was to have to close something down now no problem at all quite happily step in and taking the responsibility to do it it's not about running away and hiding from stuff it's taking responsibility and taking action to carry that job through and, and and actually, you know, it, 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 it's it is a positive thing. It's it, you're 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 doing it for a good reason. Something's not right. Yeah. You 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 you're making a decision, um, and uh, and and you take that learning uh, and apply it to 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 a, a different model. Um, yeah. So uh, so I think I think that's that's really important. Uh, you know, I think one of your tips you had, it, it, it's very simple, but. You talked about taking people out of the business, but even even if you're sort of having a meeting, just changing where when you have a break, changing where people sit in the room, yes. uh, really simple. But it changes the routine, ch uh, mixes it up a bit, and and just gets people people thinking. Um, yeah. So in the uh, uh, Celtic Castles business right now, uh, of course, uh, you know, one of the things that I wanted to talk about was COVID, the pandemic. Um, you know, I, I, I'm assuming there must be quite a struggle for you and your clients right now. Is that is that fair to say? Uh, that would be very fair to say. I mean, obviously, it's like somebody just turned a tap off uh, at the end of March and said, right, you know, everybody's got to cancel. Um, we've had to, you know, close the office you know, develop remote working. 
Um, I took on board the administration. I didn't want it to, to be too onerous on the team. I let them do all the comm side, but I was stamping the cancellations. And that is the most painful thing in the world to do. It's like just ripping up pie notes. Um, and, you know, work that you'd spent, you know, 18 months putting together, uh, just evaporating and no guarantee that it was ever going to come back. So I actually got myself in, in quite a negative space with that, taking it on board. And it got to the stage where I said, right, I've got to stop working at lunchtime um, and uh, just get out. And I, I was I was sort of losing it a wee bit and just getting really, really, really down about the whole thing and not being able to see where we, you know, we didn't have a date to start again. What was it going to look like? And so much uncertainty. So I did a couple of things. <clears throat> I, uh, I joined a Facebook group that grew flowers. I'm into gardening, so it was growing flowers to give away to people. <clears throat> so that was a, a lovely positive, um, and it was taking me away from the cancellations. And I also started woodwork, and um, I started to build bird boxes, of all things. And oh, wow. I really got into, you know, how does this work? And uh uh, I'm getting more exotic with what I'm producing. Uh, and also then redesigned my back garden because I had a little bit of time. And, and slowly but surely, what happened was my energy level started to come back up again. My creativity was really, really energized. And then I came back into the business uh, like a whirlwind. And we, we people working remotely, and we started to come up with really new creative ideas. So we introduced 300 new castles and I flipped an idea that I had in my head because we wanted experts in countries. I said, no, let's change that. Let's go and get the countries working with bookings coming through and then we'll find the experts. So that's been quite uh, energizing. And then we also looked at how do we introduce uh, and find areas where we can, instead of relying on Google and word of mouth, how can we create an introducer system for quality people that can drive traffic and high net worth customers into this idea of having a castle experience. So the lockdown a little hard at the start, and it is still difficult because we've hardly taken any money this year, um, but we're still, or I am very optimistic as our members of the team about where this is gonna go as soon as we start to come out of it. And obviously very positive to hear, you know, the, uh, the thoughts that there could be a vaccine on the horizon and, uh, you know, we're in a very strong position now for when this comes back uh, to go through. But well, on saying, I was just going to say, on saying that from a business perspective, you need to have, you know, resources in place to carry this through. Because if we hadn't had the reserves, uh, and a lot of people, a lot of businesses work from hand to mouth, if we hadn't had the reserves, we wouldn't be here today. It, it, it's about having a, being able to have a strong recovery, isn't it? And and yeah, yeah. you need those you need yeah. those reserves to be able to achieve that. Uh, I mean, I guess that that you've got a quite a strong value set, and 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 in in fact, very strongly in businesses uh, have visions, values, missions, um, and, uh, and and to just tell me more about your value set, and and I think I think probably how that's helped you ensure that you had reserves. Well, <clears throat> as part of um, any business, I believe that everyone should have a mission, purpose and value uh, element to it. So they understand <clears throat> what they're there for, really, and what's what's the why in, in their business. But I also take that then into my personal life as well. So I think personally, we should all have a mission, purpose and values. And, and when I look at my values, it's about freedom, choice and security <clears throat> and success falls in there as well. But it's probably part of those those first three, um, <clears throat> and that's what I lead my sort of life by. And um, when I'm making decisions, I always come back to those values to see do those tie in, you know, from a business perspective or a personal perspective. And uh, how does that look, you know, for the decision that's been made? I'll, I'll let you have a, I'll let you have a drink. I'm getting you to talk too much. <laughs> <laughs> it's uh, so so uh, the the values you know you talked about freedom choice security success yeah. um do they uh, do they um uh, have you replicated them within the business are they very similar inside the business as well uh, in the business our values would be respect for others exceptional customer service a passion for excellence and then value for money and value for money is probably my fifth uh value um but yeah 
that that's the business element but as i say when we when i bring it into my personal uh side of things then uh that's uh that's what i sort of run my life by but this is what the team would work to and then i've got my personal ones how are you managing to keep the team engaged and uh, you know it must be a very difficult time I, I guess you're using things like furlough um but um but you know i, I guess well you, they, that was running out until very recently um yeah. so how do you how do you how are you how do you keep the team i mean you know is the answer just money or is are you doing other things or, or just sort of hope and uh, what's the how are you keeping that ethos going um it, it, our, our t we're very lucky with the team <clears throat> and I think you know we see, we see the team as more family um, and, and maybe they they see see that as well but we've got a lot of really long service so 16 17 18 19 years um, so you know that's that's part of our glue but also you know as employers um, it's about people and um, Julie on the team you know is fantastic at you know being our, our people person and you know it is almost like family uh, we all look out like for each other uh, we all support each other i've mentioned the feedback model earlier on you know it's about us all working together for a common purpose and that's where the, they... that's i suppose where the, the customer element comes in because we share all of that whenever we get feedback it's it's something we celebrate um and it's about us helping them to help us they're, and they're clearly bought into, you know, the, there's a bigger vision here as we get out of lockdown uh, or, or, or out of this pandemic. And, and, and there's a there's a much bigger um, picture. Which countries have you managed to step into then recently? Uh, would you believe it? The States. There are some castles in the States. Uh, Germany, Spain, uh, Portugal, uh, amongst others. So I'm continually starting to look at countries. Um, I'm quite inspired to go into India. Um, so I'd like to get in there, <clears throat> but um, as I say, we, we've swift that on the head. So we want to develop the traffic for these areas, and then we're going to look for experts within them to do, I suppose, what I do with my sort of Castleman hat on uh, to share that knowledge and experience of, of the properties. So um, it's been good fun, and we're looking forward to developing that further. Is it, is it possible to even describe what it's like to stay in a castle? Um, they're all unique. They're totally different. I mean, I, I love staying in them just for the experience. Uh, and of course, I suppose I've got that other thing that I want to be able to share that with customers that I speak to. But, you know, I'll get up at four in the morning and just sit in the Great Hall um, and, and, and just wonder, gosh, you know, what happened here 400 years ago, etc. You see how people refurbish them. I was in the Duke of Devonshire's um, castle for three days um, and this is Lismore Castle down on the banks of the Blackwater River and um, you know just just being in that and pinching myself saying am I really here um, you know it's 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 a wonderful privilege to have the experience and be able to share that um, but also meet the people behind the scenes who own these properties etc but every experience is different it could be top-end luxury it could be down to the fact that there's no electricity and no running water and all you've got are candles and a flower. I mean, those are the two extremes that, that, that we deal with. And they're brilliant for all different reasons. <laughs> I, 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 uh, I highly recommend checking out Celtic Castles for uh, for when uh, things reopen uh, and, uh, uh, and, and seeing uh, some of the pla great places you could stay. Um, you you talk about um, I mean you've clearly got a, you know a huge enthusiastic approach to to business and uh, and, and helping people um, put the right things in place. You talk about uh, making sure that you measure things and 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 uh, constantly sort of checking things. What are the what what do you mean by that? What are the key things that we should be keeping an eye on or thinking about um, and and being sort of having our finger on on the pulse with regard to to measuring. Um, I think if you're running a website, um, we're looking at the sort of key volume stuff coming through. But but for me, it's not about every detail. What I want to know on the website is how many forms have been filled in, um, the amount of communication 
between those uh, and then the conversion rate. So that's our sort of KPI. Um, if you're looking at the statistics in the business uh, from the accountancy side of things, it's cash flow, it's, you know, are people paying on time, uh, etc. And just understanding the key parameters and, you know, spend time, go on a course, read, read a book about it and understand what are the key parameters that you need to look out for. Um, and you can spot a lot on a balance sheet that will, you know, lead you to, you know, think about the right stuff further down the line. And it might be six months away, but you picked it up in, in, in March instead of August. Um, so it's about getting easy, measurable stuff. Don't go OTT on it. I mean, I've been in, in publishing and, you know, seen office fulls of statistics coming out, nobody ever looking at them. Get stuff that works for your business uh, and, and keep it simple. I'd worked with a, um, a photographer once and just got him to uh, itemize where he was spending his time, what revenue was coming in, and the markets that he wanted to get into. And just by analyzing that on a spreadsheet over a couple of months, he was able to refocus where he put his energy and increase the profit he was bringing in on his business. And that's a key element. Know where you make your money so that you know where to put your resource. Every business, you will get 80% of your revenue from 20% of your activity. So understanding where that activity is to generate the most profit is important. And it's worth taking time out just to understand that. Yeah, it's very important. Um, one of your values is, is freedom. And um, and here you do get time to sort of sit in the garden and, and be creative and think. And, and, and that's something to really enjoy and, and going for walks, etc. How, how have you managed to achieve that in the business? Is it is it through putting processes in place what's the what's the is, is the one thing or is there, is there something that you can say this is what helped me have freedom from my business to be able to stand back and, and trust that they can just get on with it i think you've got to have a strong team to start with they need to be trained processes are important um them understanding the responsibility we we, we have monthly one-to-ones with our team members so that they understand the projects that they're involved in and, and their responsibility within the business um for me it's actually uh about not being involved i love to dive in helicopter in really get into detail look at it and then step out again uh, I like to support the team if they're looking after a specific project. Uh, but for me also, it's about not making it that easy for people to get hold of me um, and not getting tied up all the time. So, you know, not many people will have my mobile number. And if they want to get in touch with me, you know, email I'll see all the time. But otherwise, it's through the office and then we'll, we'll arrange a time that works for me. So I'm not letting people eat into my time, which helps me manage the freedom that I you sort of desire. How do you? How did you take the step to? What What made you realize that was a good thing to stop being so available? What, how did you achieve that? Because I, I think I think there's a lot of people out there that would find that quite difficult to do. Um, trust. I suppose you've got to trust the team will be able to deliver, and also if something goes wrong, that you're there to support as opposed to critique. Um, and, and having that confidence that they're able to do that. I think I've been a busy fool in the past. I remember a classic in M&S when I was on the food section, chucking bread on a counter and we'd had to open up all the tills. And, um, you know, I'm still trying to fill this counter and I looked and the queues had all gone. And if I just looked left, <laughs> I could have taken four people off the counter and had it filled straight away. So that was one of the key lessons I learned in M&S. And it's just simple stuff like that. Um, Stop some back. It's been smart. It's been smart. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I've found this conversation really fascinating uh, and uh, it, you know it, it, it's great to see the knowledge that you've got and the enthusiasm that you've got around business um, and uh, and what you've set up with the uh, the Celtic castles and no wonder you called the castle man uh, it, it's uh, you know I, I think if, if anyone out there is is wanting to find out uh, more about castles Roger is your man uh, so um, where would people find you online I, I guess the the website uh, uh, but tell us more. Yeah, uh, CelticCastles.com. That's our sort of main pivotal point. Um, you can come in there. Uh, I'm obviously on all the social channels. We've got some links on the website. I'm on LinkedIn, etc. Uh, but yeah, just just do a search on the Castle Man, Celtic Castles, or my name, and um, I'll pop up, or the, or the team will pop up. Roger, finally, on the um, 
uh, you know, you, you do enjoy helping businesses. Is there a particular type of business or a particular, what's the attractive thing? What's the, is the, is the, is the, what's the, what's the attractive type of business that would, uh, that would really, you'd quite like to work with? I, I love the SME market. It can be any business. And, and for me, it's, it's, it's more about what I learn as well when I'm interacting or supporting these businesses. Um, and it's about seeing other people succeed. And maybe if I can share a little nugget that helps them. I mean, the photographer was a classic. He, he instead of, you know, working on a sort of hand to mouth basis. Uh, I remember one January, he just contacted me, says, listen, I've got enough money now to last till May. And I just thought, job done. I've changed that thinking. And he's benefited from that. So, so that to me, and, and, you know, we still keep in touch, which is lovely. And, you know, the thought that he's, his life has changed as a result of that is, is what I get from it. So um, the SME market is what tickles me, really. I like it. And Nigel Greenwood uh, has said, great conversation, guys. Thank you. Uh, we're looking forward to some of the stuff Nigel's coming out with in the next few months as well. Uh, and he's very much about the customer. Uh, so, uh, so yeah, that backs up uh, uh, what we've been talking about. Uh, very much looking forward to seeing what Celtic Castles has for us in the coming year. So uh, we'll be watching for that. Uh, thanks so much again. Thanks for watching. Thanks for listening. Uh, and, uh, and if you want to keep uh, on top of more, please do subscribe and share this. Uh, we'll see you all soon and uh, take care. Thanks, Johnny.